Hey everyone, how's it going? Juan Das here, and welcome back to this week's lesson video for the YouTube channel. And I hope you enjoyed the Bach that I uploaded yesterday, and I'm sorry for being a little delayed uh, with the lesson. As I mentioned, construction happening in the building. I have no idea when it's going to end. It seems like it's a moment of silence right now, so I hope it's not going to come back anytime soon. Now, Hopefully I can start getting back to schedule and doing that, but in order to make up for it, I wanted to upload this week's part one and actually upload, if I can, part two. Uh, today is Saturday, so on Sunday I'm going to be uploading part two. And I wanted to touch on a couple of things, because the Bach was a video, a video topic, just enjoying some coffee. This one's going to be a long one, by the way, so feel free to grab a coffee or something and get yourself comfortable. So, when it comes to the Bach, there's so much incredible information in there, and it's really a very frequently referenced, um, a very frequently referenced uh, repertoire to learn from for any musician. You could be a guitar player, a bassist, a pianist, uh, a wind instrument, um, a horn in some like trumpet, flugel, whatever. Um, and in so many ways, Bach is just extremely helpful, and it's very prescribed. I prescribe it to many of my own students. Now, the Presto is always a piece I return to every few months, and it was only in maybe in the past month or so that I decided, okay, I'm gonna really learn this inside out, memorize it, and start applying it, and I learned quite a few things along the way. So much so that I'm making this a two-part video, um, as mentioned before. The first part is going to be what you can learn as an improviser. What can you learn as an improviser from Bach, and uh, how can you apply that to a more contemporary context? Um, that was the initial video idea I had, and I think there's a lot to be gleaned from this, and it references some topics I've mentioned uh, but the reason I want, I've mentioned in past videos, but the reason I wanted to do this was simply because the examples are so crystal clear, and this is often why Bach has prescribed everything is right in front of you. There's very little guesswork to be done when you analyze it. And the second part uh, was, at the uh, was at the suggestion of my friend Kincho Kane, uh, who runs the YouTube channel Streetwise Guitar. Uh, do go check that out. It's a wonderful resource, and Kinch is an incredible teacher um, with a lot of experience under his belt. He saw one of the um, little stories I'd done saying, hey, this is what I'm working on, and he gave me some very sound advice that reminded me of some of the stuff I'd been working on over the past year, and I wanted to really touch on sound, tone, articulation, and dynamics. Things that I think are very easy to forget about if you're not a classical musician, and especially us coming from a jazz background, we, we think a lot about data, we think a lot about information. What's, the har what's happening in the harmony? What, uh, what is he playing? What sound is he using? Um, I think that's something that's very seldom discussed because of how abstract it can be, is how does it sound what dynamic should I use? Um, are my notes clear? And sometimes we can sacrifice that to get the notes out. So, without further ado, let's get into the lesson. So, there are a couple of things as an improviser that you can learn from Bach. And some of those are pretty straightforward, some of those not as much. One of the biggest things is his sense of voice leading. Uh, I referenced this in the melodic voice leading video, and here there are very clear examples, and rather, not just his voice leading, his clarity. The voice leading kind of is connected to that. Uh, let's take the opening phrase of the G minor, so the descending arpeggio. And ascending. avoided the resolution there specifically, because if that isn't 
a more obvious way of stating we are in the key of G minor, I don't know what is. But there is a clarity behind every note. And how it reflects. And even when I take it to the next change, that is a... I'm implying the root here, I'm playing the root as a reference, but that is a very clear way of getting to the five chord, getting to um, the next chord tone, even when you hear uh, a little further on. Very clear statement, right? We've got C minor, C minor seven actually, then B flat major, B flat major seven actually. A minor seven flat five. Very clear statements of the harmony, there's no guesswork. And oftentimes one of the main issues I find in <clears throat> students who are beginning improvisers uh, reflects a little bit with the chord scale approach in the X scale works over X chord. I've made references to this in the past. While uh, I know some people are very on the fence about chord scale relationships, uh, they're either love or hate. I'm really somewhere in the middle. Um, I don't think the chord scale theory relationship is bad in any way. I think that sometimes the way it can be taught is a little incomplete. And um, especially when it pertains to functional harmony, not everything can be referred to under modal references. So, um, as you see through any of those passages, you can clearly hear the harmony in pretty much anywhere. So one of the things I suggest is, as an improviser, step one, what you can do is lift these ideas, treat them as if they were a transcription, take the ideas and break them down and understand, okay, what is going on? So let's say this motion. So what's happening is we're on the one chord, G minor in this case, a little bit out of tune. Yeah, a little high. So we can take that note and then, so, we have the root and the fifth of the chord, scale tone, going to the third, and that's leading to the third of the five chord. So you can take this approach and then apply it, let's say, okay, let's put it in a different key, right? So let's say, for ease of use, A minor to E7, right? So, right? That is another way of moving it around. Let's take it to a different key. Um, what about C sharp minor? So, right? And then, okay, let's go to the original source material. And then that's going back to the one chord. Um, what was it? Yeah, that's what I was missing. I was missing that extra part on the end, so. So let's take that from five to one. C sharp minor, like we were in before. And that's a very clear statement of five to one. Now, in a minor key, what if we did this actually in major? It's a little more tension building, but maybe you can see what I'm slowly starting to hint at. Why is this useful? Let's take a look at the progression that we were breaking down, five to one. Where do we see that very commonly? Two five ones in the jazz repertoire. And this is very clear statements of how to outline harmony. Now, yes, you could go to Bird, you could go to 
train, you could go to Sonny Stitt or any great improviser on the horn, and you will get a lot of the bebop inflections. But the core harmonic information is still the same of how can you voice lead and clearly state your harmony and clearly state what is going on um, harmonically. As I've made a reference to in the past, harmony is melody and melody is harmony. They're both very closely interlinked. So you can take this and start incorporating it as language. Then start looking at the fundamental information and go, okay, how can I tweak this, let's say. Uh, I can maybe add interval jumps. Approach notes. Right? Or add little enclosures, little turns, and suddenly you're taking the lessons from Bach, but you're not quoting Bach verbatim. You're twisting and turning it and coming up with your own thing. And that's something I really want to stress. Um, I've heard a lot of musicians, especially in recent months, referencing this, but it's important. Take the information, learn, break it down, but come up with your own thing. Something I need to remind myself of every now and then. So, other things you can learn from Bach. One is, another thing you can learn is his sense of development. And this helps with your motivic ideas. So, let's take, for example, where we've heard the first statement, and you can see also how he applies it to moving around other um, melodic ideas. So let's say one that you, that's quite prominent is, I'm just trying to get to it, here. Then more development. Statement of a new idea, repetition, but moving it through, moving it through a set of harmony or a set of chord changes. And you can see how much he actually repeats ideas. He's taking this melodic cell of just an ascending scale pattern and using a pedal point to move, to kind of help ground the idea a little more. Right? Here, again. Here's more development. Taking the same idea and pushing it about. Again. 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 Development and... Resolution. I hope I've made my point clear with that. Bach was a master of just taking an idea and pushing it about. So this can be, how can an improviser learn from this? We can take the idea, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to pick an arbitrary key. Let's say the key of B flat. Uh, and I'm going to take that melodic motif. That's just in one key. Now, what if I took this over a set of changes? Um, let's say the opening for Beautiful Love. Right? Um, and I'm going to take that idea. So. Uh, sounds a little bit like an exercise, right? But now what if I make it a little more musical? Uh, a little 
reference to the melody there. But you can take this idea, and a good exercise to start working on this is take a comfortable melodic cell and start pushing it around a key and see what variations you can come up with. Eventually take some of the wider interval stuff. Right? So already we've seen development and we've also seen clarity. Take these ideas and begin to incorporate them. Another thing we can look at is how Bach treats sequences or how he sequences an idea. For example, I don't hear too many jazz musicians playing stuff like like the opening phrase. It's a bit of a blunt statement. It's a bit direct. It's a bit overly obvious. But let's say, and I've noticed with the jazz realm, we have a tendency to sometimes maybe only play a, uh, a singular statement of an arpeggio or a similar idea and then move to a different one. Very much like... Yeah, that was it. Right? We have a tendency to do that. Now let's say in a more contemporary context, something similar would be... Uh, what was the one I had? Right, for like a five chord. Right, I'm taking, I'm just taking one idea and I'm not really developing it much further. Now, what we can learn is, okay, let's say we take sequencing. And we can get a little more mileage out of a singular idea. So let's say, I don't know, I'm going to adapt this to a different thing. Uh, that would be a cool one for like a major 7 sharp 5. general idea. I'm not sticking it verbatim to an arpeggio, I'm just moving it about. It kind of ties in with my last point, actually. So you can start taking these ideas and really getting the most out of it. Now, if I were to, say, hone in on one particular thing, hone in on your clarity more than anything else, and then the development, because this is going to be immediately applicable to... Um, standards or your original repertoire. For example, if we look at a closer analysis of Bach, there is no guessing as to what the harmony is. There are very clear statements that this is a G minor chord, this is a D major chord, this is X, Y, and Z. This is the sound I'm playing. Now, you don't have to be obvious all the time. Sometimes, yes, a sound can be, or an aesthetic, can be created by being deliberately a little more abstract, but great players have this in common with Bach, so to speak. Um, they're able to clearly state harmony and clearly state that, and there is melody to be found within the chords themselves and to really bring out the chord colors them in and of itself. So really try hone in on that and take Take a tune and try see how you can clearly move through the harmony of the tune. That's one exercise. Then try see what melodic statements you can develop. So, I hope this lesson was a little more constructive and something that maybe gets you thinking of like, okay, what can I do with Bach or any other composer or reference that you're working with? And how can I take the ideas and begin to work on them and build something and create. What lessons can I learn from this? I think uh, if you take anything away from this lesson, think of what is the lesson to be learned from working on this piece of music. Rather than just work on the means to an end, 
uh, and say, okay, I'm just learning the piece, get inside the piece. And this is why I say, full disclaimer, I'm not a classical musician by any means. I'm just someone who loves this music and thinks there are many lessons to be learned from it. And in doing so, really say, what are the lessons you can learn from Bach? Clarity, development, motivic ideas, there are endless ones. I just wanted to touch on some ones that I found really important and really helpful for me. So take care, and I will see you in the part two for this video where I'll really dive into touch, tone, and sound. Until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.